All right. Let me get resituated here. We can bring up our uh, our PDF, our outline, and I'm going to be adding a little bit to this, so I won't have the full lecture in this uh, PDF, but I'll add to it after we're done tonight, and I'll upload probably tomorrow uh, the fuller PDF, which uh, we're going to we're going to commemorate some other things from the great elder. And so you will not see those on the screen, some of them tonight, but we'll add to them. So let's, uh, let's begin with, uh, this is lesson two, definition of terms. Uh, but we might also add to the title a look at the person of St. Andrew of Caesarea. Caesarea. Uh, so let's begin there. Let's look at a little bit about the, about the text. As some of you brought up in your questions previously that this was a a bit of a question as to its legitimacy or some question its legitimacy uh, in church history and in the East, uh, especially in the West, uh, there was not much of a question as to legitimacy. And we'll see why in the East there was, but it was fairly, fairly quickly overcome. Uh, so it is, it was, uh, you see on the left, the various English editions of this uh, text, uh, one from the Fathers of Church series from Catholic University Press and an Orthodox uh, scholar there who produced that translation. And then we also have the that from the ancient Christian text. And we're going to be using uh, both of those, uh, probably more the uh, first above in our uh, examination. The Book of Revelation was, from the outset, universally accepted as genuine and apostolic. From the early six, second century, we have church fathers who are commemorating and 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 celebrating uh, the text? Um, by the way, um, we have some wonderful things I'll be adding. Unfortunately, I didn't get that tonight, but next week, from uh, the great uh, teacher of, of Holy Scripture at Jordanville, uh, Archbishop Averki, who commemorates in his introduction some of the church fathers who embraced the text, and I'll just share that with you. Um, we can find quotations from the book in St. Irenaeus of Lyon, St. Polycarp of Smyrna, the disciple of the great theologian, uh, St. Hippolytos of the Pope of Rome, who did an analysis uh, himself, and a disciple of Irenaeus. He actually wrote an apology for the book of Revelation. Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, the great teacher in Africa, and Origen, uh, likewise acknowledged the holy apostle John as the writer of the Apocalypse, in the same way, a friend of Syria, Epiphanios, Basil the Great, Hilary, uh, Portier, uh, Athanasius the Great, Gregory the Theologian, Didymus, Ambrose, Augustine, Jerome, were all convinced of this. And the 33 canon of the Council of Carthage, ascribing the Apocalypse to St. John the Theologian, places it in rank with the other canonical books. Uh, so the as the um, as Archbishop Verki says, the, the absence of it in some Translations such as the Syriac uh, is accounted uh, account uh, by accounted to, for by the fact that they were looking only at the um, uh, those that were read in divine services, and since the revelation was not read in divine services, uh, it does not appear there. And it is not. Uh, uh, at all odd that it doesn't uh, uh, is not read in divine services. Some people were questioning that. Um, you know, the divine services are going to be read for the whole people of God, and this book, which requires a great deal of um, knowledge, background to its interpretation, obviously would be a difficult book and led lead to some misunderstanding among the faithful if it was read without in any interpretation uh, immediately afterwards and so uh that's that's a very basic practical reason why you don't find it uh read in the churches uh on a, on a regular basis now um so we commemorated some of the fathers the early church fathers who all embraced it but it was later disputed and then it was even rejected in the east to a large degree because not for its own sake per se but because it was used by heretical sects uh, such as the Chilias and the Montanists. Uh, we're going to be talking quite a bit about Chiliasm over the course of this uh, this lecture series, 
So we won't mention anything right now, but it is an ancient heresy that has reared its head once again. And um, uh, you'll hear it commemorated quite a bit during the course. St. Andrew's patristic and orthodox explanation uh, is seen as one of the main reasons, crucial reasons, that the church again embraced it. Now that he was writing, as you'll see uh, in the uh, end of the... Uh, the uh, beginning of the seventh century, actually, we date his uh, writing of his uh, uh, his interpretation of the Book of Revelation to six eleven A.D. That's according to uh, Evgenia Constantino, and this was right between the capture of the city of Caesarea by the Persians and the total destruction by when the Persians departed, they're driven out by the Romans, and they burned the city. So. This is her, um, and I think the scholars generally agree, this is probably the most likely time period. So at 611, we had this interpretation written, and it became the patristic standard interpretation of the book of Revelation from that point on. So there really is not any reason for us to doubt at all the legitimacy in, uh, of this book being a book by the great apostle and it being accepted by the church's consciousness. Now, there was a previous attempt just shortly before uh, St. Andrew wrote his uh, by a certain Ecumenios, and that's actually included in this English edition. Both his and St. Andrew's translations are included. And he was a Monophysite, what some call the non Chalcedonians today because of the uh, desire for some to be reconciled uh, and to be considered Orthodox. But at that time, of course, post um, Chalcedon, he would have been considered a Monophysite by the Orthodox uh, since he rejected the council and was in the communion of those who rejected the council. Uh, his interpretation was originistic and philosoph philosophical and Hellenistic in tone, and it contained many unorthodox conclusions. And so it's likely that St. Andrew was actually responding in part to this text, and he wrote his own interpretation. He was asked by many, why was he asked? Perhaps because this was one of the only, in Greek, this was written in Greek by Ecumenios, one of the only uh, texts in circulation in the Greek language, and so there were people who were being misled by his errors. And so in part, St. Andrew is responding to this problem that was created, and that is not a surprise because he is always like all the church fathers, approaching things in a pastoral manner. That's why they're writing for the sake of the flock. So if that's a that's a basic uh, characteristic of the church fathers. So when you see today in the church theologians and pa and bishops and others who are not primarily writing out of concern for the flock and presenting the teachings of the God of God uh, and of the Holy Fathers, to the people of God to protect them from the various heresies. That's a sign that there's something wrong with those people who are not caring for the flock of Christ. The fathers always wrote, and this role, this stance as a pastor dominates the interpretation of uh, Revelation uh, by St. Andrew. Uh, he decides to undertake the task of the commentary since doing so will serve, I'm quoting uh, Constantino here, as a form of contempt for the present things, well, he's she's quoting the, the St. Andrew, as a form of contempt for the present things since they are transitory and for the purpose of coveting the future things since these remain. And he says, goes on, but everyone can benefit from reading the apocalypse because it contributes not a little to compunction. One of the great presuppositions for any spiritual progress his contrition, compunction, give me a broken heart, a broken, a contrite heart, O oh Lord, that I will not despise. And so he says this book leads to this basic goal of every Christian, teaches that death must be despised. Yet another basic principle in the spiritual life, remember death, but do not fear it. Remember death, but do not fear it. The book is also worthy for reading by the faithful. So it's not a specialist book. It's not a theologian only, academics especially. Theologian's book, but it's for the faithful. Of course, we've already heard and said that it's blessed is he who reads this book. It guides those 
who read it to true life. Uh, it is holy and God inspired and guides those who read it to a blessed end. So he's now obviously writing this because some people doubted this and they were perhaps questioning the legitimacy and the and the usefulness of the book itself. And so the great pastor and teacher of Kesaria uh, is uh, giving us why we need now what 1,400 some odd 300 years later, 400 years later, we're still reading his commentary and still bending from, him, from his call to delve in. Now, in stark contrast to Ecumeno, it's very interesting and uh, important point. Like, you know, when you're preparing these courses, there's so much material and you just have to make choices uh, because we only have so long and I don't want to, you know, it can get tiresome if we just go on and on and we could, we could, I could probably make 40 or 50 slides up every week, but I don't think that's as profitable for all of us. Uh, obviously, uh, those who are very serious and want to go deeper can get the books themselves and delve into them. We've commemorated those in the previous lecture, what those books are. Uh, and of course, the, the most importantly, I would say is Elder Athanasius' interpretation because it's so, in the spirit of St. Andrew, it's so pastoral and so contemporary and so important. The messages that he's given are so important. So uh, this is a very interesting and important point for us today uh, in terms of ecclesiology and in terms of our understanding of the church. So let's listen. This is taken again from the introduction by uh, the scholar Constantino of Guinea, and I appreciate her contribution here. She points out that St. Andrew's Orthodox interpretation is in stark contrast in many ways with Ecumenios' monophysite originistic view, including with regard to the mysteries, to the mysteries of the church. And why, uh, um, why is that? Well, let's hear. St. Andrew interprets the promise of uh, hidden manna in Revelation 2.17 to the church of Pergamon as the Eucharist, seems pretty obvious, and connects the bread of life statements in John the 6th, in John 6, where he says that manna come down from heaven, etc. This is, uh, uh, according to St. Andrew and the Church Fathers, the Eucharist. By contrast, Ecumenio simply states that the hidden manna signifies spiritual and future blessings. For St. Andrew, the woman wrapped in the sun with the moon under her feet, Revelation 12.1, represents the church which was, has baptism as its foundation. Ecumenios, on the other hand, associates the moon with the law of Moses, which is, he believes, is waning. Very different interpretations. Not an accident, brothers and sisters. It's not an accident. Heresy and originistic views and philosophical approaches and monophysite teachings obviously are going to distort and undermine the teachings and the interpretations of the scriptures. St. Andrew associates the seal on the foreheads of the faithful, Revelation 7.3 with the mystery of chrismation, with the mystery of chrismation, the sacrament con connection, which again, a sacramental connection, which again, Gumenios does not make. And these are very significant and good for us to remember as we go forward, how that if you are not immersed in the life of the church, if you are not immersed in the spiritual life in the life of the church, and do not, do not understand the spiritual life. You cannot interpret scripture. Very basic. Academic theologians who do not live intensely the, um, uh, the life of the church are not going to understand. The, they do not have the spiritual presuppositions. We're going to actually uh, focus on this a little bit later in the lecture tonight from our great elder Athanasios. But you can see here that he was a pastor, and therefore he understood things in the context of the Eucharist and the spiritual life of the church. So important. And so many people have fallen away from the proper understanding of this book because they're not immersed and they're not looking at it the way. And, of course, all the church fathers, again, understood it in this context. Very, very important. This is one of the dangers today among Orthodox who are going forward, as I am here, and we're all in danger, and including myself, when we are teaching a you know an audience which is possibly orthodox possibly not orthodox it could be all kinds of different backgrounds listening to me tonight i don't know um we have 
you know, about 200 people, 250 people looks like right now live watching us, you know, and so what happens is there's a danger that we will be disoriented and not follow the example of the great St. Andrew and all the church fathers and be dis, dis, disoriented and, and drawn away from the immersing ourselves and continually coming back and going deeper spiritually in the Eucharistic and uh, hesychastic life of the church. And of course, we're going to end up falling away. You know, today I might teach orthodoxy, but if I continue this for five years and I don't, can, I don't maintain a, an intense spiritual life while I'm doing it, there's no telling what I could end up saying in five years or 10 years. How about those who've come into the church and immediately ascend the podium? As many people in the Western world, sometimes out of good necessity to care for those flocks that they brought in with them. I'm not accusing anyone, but it is a danger. It's in a danger. You've just entered the church. You're essentially a neophyte. And now you're you're ascending the podium to, to, to interpret the scriptures when you still have yet to go deep and to become a true initiate through uh, time and asceticism. Uh, and so it, this if this this only drives home even more the need for all of us to run to the church fathers in every way uh, and not innovate in any way when we're interpreting scripture. Now, St. Andrew gives us some wonderful um, uh, principles in interpretation of scripture uh, in his prologue. He says, the Holy Scripture is endowed with three parts by divine grace. And he says, since there are three parts to the human being, all divinely inspired scripture has been endowed with three parts by divine grace. And by this, he means the body, the soul, and the spirit. And so the body is somewhat like the letter and like history established according to sense perception. So that's one aspect of inspired scripture, the letter and the history. He says, in like manner, the soul is the figurative sense, guiding the reader from that which can be perceived by the senses to that which can be perceived by the intellect. This is the second aspect of the divine inside scriptures that they like the soul, liken it, liken it and taking it from the three part and this part of the soul from that which is perceived by the senses, the externals to the internal, to the that which is uh, by the intellect. Now, by the intellect, we understand the noose. We don't understand the rational intellect, but the noose. Um, so we're, uh, we're, we're ascending the ladder of divine illumination. But then we also have the third part, like the spirit. Likewise, the spirit has appeared to be the anagogical, that which, which offers up, which, uh, which gives up to a higher uh, meaning, the anagogical sense, the contemplation of the future and higher things. Contemplation, the theoria, we would say in Greek, that which the ascetics are, are in a pursuit of, through their prayer and their Jesus prayer. If anybody's read the life of Elder Joseph the Hesychast, talks about Theoria quite a bit. And this is the contemplation of those things of God, the future and higher things. So that, he says, the first level, moreover, is appropriate to the ones guarded by the law. As pedagogy. This is how he likens now the first level to the period of the pre-incarnation, we're talking about the law, we're talking about the pedagogy. The law was a pedagogy to bring us to Christ. The second to the ones who are governed by grace. All right, so all of us who are in, in the church. The third of those who exist in the blessed condition in which the Spirit governs. You see again, by the way, we just posted in Orthodox Ethos again, or we've been sharing on social media rather, a very important little video that we did during our ecclesiological uh, or class on ecclesiology in which we present the teachings of saint maximus the confessor on the the different energies and operations of the holy spirit in creation among those who are of, of the law and those who are in the spirit in the church uh, inside and outside the church how the divine uh, energies of the holy spirit of god operate and function depending on the presuppositions of those who are coming 
and how they're living and where they are in, in terms of initiation. And here you see something very similar. It reminds us of something that St. Maximus will say uh, in just uh, chronologically uh, after uh, about this time in church history. Um, so he says, the third to those who exist in the blessed condition in which the spirit governs having subordinated to it all carnal thoughts and emotions. So not only those who are governed by grace, not only those who are initiated, but those who have now made progress, those who are uh, making progress in the science of the spiritual life and ascending. Uh, so those three levels. Very interesting, very helpful, I think, for all of us to remember and to come back to, understand how we're supposed to approach Holy Scripture. Uh, so we're, before we, so we're, we're ready to get into the actual first verse of uh, Revelation. We're going to look at that shortly. Um, just a moment. Yeah, I, we could go on, but let's um, let's jump into the to the text and then we'll look at uh, some aspects of of this first verse. We're really going to be looking at the first sentence, <laughs> believe it or not, not even uh, this full section here. This is actually one to four. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. And, it, and he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and keep what is written therein, for the time is near. Uh, before we, we jump in, let me just share with you an interesting um, anomaly. I don't know what to call it here, but it's very interesting that in the version cited and um, before uh, St. Andrew of, of Caesarea, uh, he has, uh, let's see if I can, <clears throat> what did I do with it? Uh, he has a, a, a slight uh, difference in the text. There where it says, even to all that he saw, uh, St. Andrew's version and the, that, he, that he quotes is slightly different. Um, and now when I want to find it here, uh, I can't find it. Uh, here it is, yes. He adds, uh, uh, after he says, in all that he saw, there is a comma, both those things which are and those things which must come to pass afterward. And it's interesting that this phrase, uh, is not is absent in many Revelation manuscripts. It represents, however, an example of the variations found in Andrew's copy of the Apocalypse. And it is important to Andrew uh, because as a whole, uh, uh, the importance of, to the commentary as a whole of St. Andrew is in the fact that Andrew relies on this particular phrase to guide his interpretation of Revelation as prophecy. So here we see interesting. This is a various manuscripts have come down to us of this text, obviously, and many texts, and there's slight differences. And this this phrase, which is not in this uh, revised standard version in English, is in his version. And I I didn't have an opportunity to go and look at the uh, some of the older ancient Greek manuscripts, but I'm wondering. It doesn't appear to be in the version that Elder Athanasius was uh, is looking at, but I'll have to look at that. But these, this phrase, of course, is not unique. I don't think the meaning here is unique to this, this actual sentence. So, you know, there might, it might be overly played here that this is so vastly important because I think this is, you can find this sentiment uh, throughout the book uh, and in, certainly in Elder Athanasius' teaching. So both those things which are and those which, are, which must come to pass afterwards. As we saw last week, prophecy is not just about the future, it's also about the past. Moses was a prophet of the past, but prophecy also is about the present. 
so which are and which are about to come, it's very much consistent with our understanding of prophecy. Not a big deal, but interesting nonetheless. Uh, so this is our text. Let's go and look at some basic uh, aspects of this introductory outline with uh, with these essential elements that the uh, the saint has included, or the uh, the apostle has included. So first of all, and I'm following Elder Athanasius' interpretation here, the official tone. It's not something uh, at all uh, like a letter to some friends or something. This is a very much reminiscent of the books of the Old Testament. Uh, it's a prophetic book. It's very clear from this line because immediately we have the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the character is apparent from the beginning by the name Revelation, by the title essentially given to this book, by the first line, first words out of the word out of the mouth of, of, of the great theologian. Number three, the authenticity and the legitimacy and the validity of this book is declared from the outset because the source of this book is God himself, Jesus Christ. No one less than Jesus Christ himself, whether speaking personally or through an angel, this is the source of this revelation. And therefore it is authentic and undoubted. Purpose is made clear from the beginning. What is the purpose of this book? To show his servants what must soon take place. The purpose is clear. What must soon take place. And so we're going to repeat this many times. And you've heard this and you'll hear it again and again. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The book of the apocalypse. The, the, the last book which prepares and, and ends the the uh, the the canonical scriptures begins the end times and immediately everything that he's writing about is going to take place and begin to take place and has taken place again and again in some instances sometimes once but sometimes repeatedly in other words the type of the end times is taking place throughout the 2000 years history of uh, uh from the first to the second coming of our lord uh, the purpose is made clear to show his servants what must take place. The identity of the writer is given, none other than, of course, St. John the Evangelist. Uh, his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's his, this is the same gospel writer that we have, John the Evangelist. The content of the book is revealed. This is the word of God. The testimony of Jesus Christ. This is the content of the book. This is not anything less than the very living God speaking to his people through his prophet. And the purpose here is not anything. It's not to scare. It's not to intimidate. It's not to sensationalize. It's nothing of the sort. It's to edify. Blessed is he who reads the words of the prophecy. And blessed are they those who hear and who keep what is written therein. This is the purpose of the book. And finally, fulfillment is imminent. It is near. The time is near, it says. For the time is near. That's how the first few lines end. Indeed, the time is at hand. The, door, the doors uh, throughout the 2,000 years of the church's history, the time is at hand. It's time to act. The Lord is acting. The warfare between God and, and the enemies of salvation are is a continuous, unrelenting warfare for all those who have eyes to see and who are, who are in the midst of it. Fortunately, we have in every age those who have trained, perhaps at least been initiated into the army of God. They put on the they put on the robe, in other words, the, the soldier's uniform, but they've left their, their rifle at home and they've, they're AWOL from the, from, the, from the battle. But the time is at hand, the time is now, the struggle is now for every generation of Christians. Uh, the book of Revelation is prophetic. Let's look at that for a second. The God manifests to man to learn to have him learn of the knowledge of God, to come to the knowledge of God. It's probably a typo there. 
St. Andrew of Caesarea says, Revelation is the declaration of hidden mysteries, which take place by the illumination of the noose, the spiritual, let's say, intellect, not the rational, but the, the higher part of the soul, whether by divine dreams or visions or in a state of wakefulness like St. John. As we've said, St. John was totally 100% awake. He was not having dreams. He was awake and he saw with his own eyes the master and the angel and all of that which has come down to us. Uh, this revelation is very important, takes place by the illumination of the spiritual intellect, the noose, the higher part. And it is not a, uh, it's the rational intellect is not what's functioning here to receive the revelation. This is, it might sound fairly simple and straightforward, but in fact, it's extremely important because those who have not been initiated and not have their noose cleansed and, and therefore, let's say, activated by the presence of the divine energies, th this is a closed book. And insofar as one makes progress in purification and illumination, then this book begins to be open to him. So you can see the disaster of those poor, uninitiated uh, uh, interpreters of Revelation who are writing books uh, about the rapture and all the rest and having movies made and all the rest. This is, unfortunately, they are to be categorized among the false prophets of the end times because they do not at all fulfill the presuppositions for proper interpretation of Scripture, and they have made a mess of it. God help them and all of us not to be deceived. Uh, and so a word about, there's much more in the chapter by the elder, but I'm giving you some of the highlights, and I've cho chosen some things I want to focus on. Uh, highly recommend, if you have not, to get the first volume, and read along with us. Uh, as we go through this whole book, uh, through again for those who are first hearing it, is from Zoe Press. Zoe Press, Z O E Press. I think it's dot. Oh, I forget. Is it dot us? Let me let me just check. Make sure. Uh, um, it is dot us. Yeah. ZoePress.us, you're going to go, and I can actually put the link right here for all of us. I'll put that in there. You can get it. No. There we go. All right. Put it up there for all of us. It's in Crowdcast and over in uh, our various social media. So you can all have access to that. This is where you want to go. All right. ZoePress.us slash revelation dash the dash the books. All right. So look at that. Check those out. Buy the book. Highly recommend it. If you're going to get the most out of this class, you're going to need to be reading along with us because I'm not going to cover everything, obviously, from, from the elders interpretations. Impossible for me to cover. He, he, uh, uh, he spoke about, I don't know what it would have been, an hour and something usually, but he is so compact and everything he's saying is so so uh, good that you really have to uh, have to look at the text yourself. So some of the things that he points out, very important here, when we're talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ to man, uh, in, in one way, God is uh, unknown and completely unknown and never can be known in uh, to his creatures and you might say well this is the revelation of jesus christ we're talking about how what are you talking about well this pertains to his essence and this is a very very important distinction we make in the orthodox church and the church fathers between the essence of god and the energies of god and this distinction brothers and sisters is so important to understand the scriptures to understand church history to understand the economy of salvation and anyone and all those who do not understand and not accept this, this, this distinction are going to fall away from the Orthodox faith. And that's unfortunately what has happened. You have scholastics in the West who essentially tripped and fell over this understanding and could not grasp it because they were looking at 
the mystery of the economy of salvation uh, and the essence of God, the oneness of God, through the philosophical lens of the pagans, the pre-Christian pagans, they allowed that to dominate, unfortunately, too much their thinking and not follow the church fathers like St. John of Damascene or St. Maximus the Confessor. And so also the whole question of epiphytic theology, which we're going to talk about now, is also something that was um, not lost, but certainly not focused on in the West nearly as much. So on the one hand, he's both known and unknown. He's known, of course, because he seeks to be known to his people, to his creation, and he seeks to be in communion with his creation, and he reveals himself through many means. We're going to talk about a few of those. Obviously, there's there's not just the incarnation. Even before the incarnation, he was revealing himself to the people of God in the, in the Old Testament, but he was revealing himself to every cre creature and uh, every human being created in his image throughout history in the natural revelation, the creation that he has created. I mean, pointing, it all points to himself. Uh, so he is known. We could go on and on and spend hours just talking about that right now, but we're not going to. We're going to hit the high points. He's unknown as well. And according to Elder Athanasius, I'm quoting, he's unsearchable, untouchable, unfathomable, everlasting, the one above the corporal and created nature because the essence of God will always escape the knowledge of all created beings. The, the essence of God will always escape. Um, so Moses did not see the essence of God on Mount Sinai. And it says clearly in Scripture, he saw the back end. The backside. What does that mean? He, he saw essentially the economy of God. He saw the energies of God. He saw the incarnation of God, but he did not see the essence of God, the foreshadowing of all of the incarnation. So he is both and. Sound familiar? You're going to hear that phrase again and again. It's both and, not one or the other. This is the royal path, the narrow path, or is always both and. If you fall away from that one. That, that that balance, that unity, you end up in the gutters of extreme liberal, or whatever you want to call it, extreme innovative worldly thinking or extreme sectarian and 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 misunderstanding of scripture in, in creating some kind of uh, heretical sect or, or schismatic group or whatever it might be. You have to stay on that royal path and keep the balance. So one of the aspects of the balance here is that we have apophatic theology and we have cataphatic theology. Both are true and both are necessary and both are apparent through uh, his revelation. So he reveals himself through creation and we see that in commemorated by the Apostle Paul in Romans 1, 20 to 21. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. The invisible things are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Who's they? Everyone. Every single human being on the face of the earth is without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful. So every human being that does not glorify God and they have no excuse because they can see God, the invisible things of God, his eternal power and God. They can see these things where? In that which he has given, which he has created, that which is manifested. He's not even talking about the incarnation at this point. He's talking about the creation of the world. How much more with the incarnation is it all apparent to us who God is and how much he loves us and how much he wants to be in communion with us? So within creation, we recognize God's qualities in the cataphatic way, right? Through the very creation. Absolutely, we do recognize God and, and the economy of God in the creation of God. All of it is made apparent to us. We have no excuse. Now, he also reveals himself through man himself, and he also reveals himself through human history. Let's look at those a bit. Again, I cannot do justice to the great elder and his teaching, so you really do need to read along with me in his commentary. So we have a natural and supra or supernatural revelation. And we're going to talk a little bit about the phenomenon of atheism here. Uh, but so natural and supernatural. Natural, we see, of course, through the creation. Supernatural, of course, is the economy of God. 
and the incarnation of God, and then and then even more than that, the the the, the revelation to, to of Jesus Christ to the apostle is an example of supernatural revelation, direct and immediate presence of God speaking face to face with His beloved. He reveals himself through creation, especially through the image of God, in other words, through man. So let's hear the words of the elder here and talk a bit about this and reflect on this. He says, we have such advanced and astounding universe, such an advanced and astounding universe. And he says much more on the, on, the, on the greatness and the beauty of the universe. And so therefore, what can we say about our God? What can we say about our God when we see such an amazing and seemingly endless uh, universe. He talks about this in the in his chapter here about modern science discovering just the seemingly endlessness. Of course, it, there is, it is finite, but it, to us it seems that we cannot find the end of the the universe. In the uni the universes, maybe is uh, more appropriate. And so, uh, what does this mean? God must be eternal. Everlasting, infinite. God is almighty, all wise. All of this should be our conclusion when we see just the greatness and grandeur of, un of the universe. So where do we see these qualities? In God's creation. God is revealed through his creation. This is why, and I want you to pay attention here, for all of those you know, I'm sure everyone here knows someone, who has rejected the very existence of God, listen to what he has to say. These are tough words, but very true. And we need to speak the truth in love to everyone. This is why, my friends, there has never been a godless nation in human history, precisely because God reveals himself through his creatures uh, until perhaps our day. But even so, it's still in process. The phenomenon of the atheism of our times is the sickened state of today's man who is in desperate need of a psychiatrist. Every atheist should be the subject of a psychiatric evaluation. In other words, he's saying to be an atheist, you have to deny reality. You have to deny all of the revelation of God in his creation. You have to deny all of the obviousness of his presence uh, in the world. The state of the atheist is not natural. God is revealed to man for the simple reason that man is the image of God. And so he's pointing now to the second aspect, as we said previously. He reveals himself through himself, through man himself. Right? He reveals himself through man himself. And he says God is revealed to man for the simple reason that man is the image of God. And we might say more specifically, God is man is the image of Christ. Christ is the image of God. We are the image of Christ. Of course, God is. Christ is God, and therefore we are the image of God. But Christ is the prototype for all of humanity. Even if he was incarnate after the creation, uh, he was eternally the prototype. And the timelessness, God did not um, have a problem with that. We might not be able to grasp it rationally, but that is the case. He is, we are katikona, according to the image and that image is God, is Christ himself. So the noose, the ruling noose, that's the spiritual higher part of the soul, reveals and discovers God not only because man can sense God with his noose, all right? Not only It's not only revealed in the noose because that's the organ God has given us to commune with him and to, to see and understand him, but because the very presence of man's mind reveals the eternal mastermind the eternal mind which created man. The very presence of his mind, of his, of his noose, right? Reveals the eternal noose. Image, likeness, mind, mastermind, however you want to put it. This is the reflection. This is how God has given us so many examples of his presence and his love. We have no excuse. None whatsoever. Anyone who turns away obviously has been scarred, has been abused, has been tricked, has been fooled, has been run out of with people who have no love. I don't know. There are many, many causes for one to fall into disbelief and reject God's presence. 
None of them ultimately can be justified. Yes, we can be sympathetic. Obviously, we should be. Yes, we understand there are many bad examples. Yes, Christians ultimately are responsible for the apostasy in the world because of our lack of being like Christ and fulfilling our, our, our potential. But even so, without our witness, without all of it, and even with the worst that the devil and the evil of this world can give, God's revelation is apparent to everyone because they're made in the image of God, because through creation itself, he is apparent to all of us. Uh, and there's much more we could say, but we're going to move on because our time seems to fly when we're here. It just seems to it's disintegrate or uh, fly away immediately before we even realize we're already here one hour. It seemed like we just started 10 minutes ago. Let's go on. Supernatural divine revelation has two aspects and very important for our interpretation of this book is to understand both of these aspects the supernatural revelation fulfills and perfects the divine the natural divine revelation so both and we have both and both supernatural and natural both of them go together both of them are inseparable both of them teach us about the person of god excuse me mount sinai course he was referring to the law of moses given the law given to moses uh mount sinai and the appearance of god to moses the prophets elias or isaiah and all the rest throughout the history of the old testament and above all of course the incarnation of the son of god itself makes up the supernatural divine revelation all right so we expect nothing more we've we've received everything with the incarnation with the Fulfillment of the economy of salvation with the ascension into heaven, there's nothing left to be revealed because the same person who, who came will come again. History will see him again and will be the same person. In other words, the person of Jesus Christ will return. So there's nothing new after his incarnation. right? Nothing, nothing we're waiting for in terms of revelation. Oh, well, let's see, something new. It's all been given through and in the incarnation and the church, which is the continuation of the incarnation. So on that level, the external, let's say, that which is given for all to understand the economy of salvation, that's all been given. We expect nothing more except the second coming of Christ. And this is, of course, the same person of Jesus Christ who's already come. So in a sense, it's not new. There's nothing new there. It's, it's still to come, but it's the same person who will come now to judge the living and the dead. So this divine revelation, however, is not limited just to those, uh, all of those, those, those um, uh, theophanias, right? The, the the revelation of God to the world, but it can be return, external and internal. In fact, the internal revelation continues in the life of the faithful, continues in the life of the church, continues because the church is Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is constantly revealing Himself a new, afresh to every single member of his body to help them understand and accept the outward revelation. So every one of us tonight who's here and is seeking the face of God, who's been initiated into the body of Christ and who seeks to be in communion with him, God is helping you, you personally, to be in communion with him and you personally to understand his revelation and you personally to understand and enter in to this revelation of Jesus Christ to the Apostle John. And how do we know that? Well, there are many things in Scripture, but just a few. St. Paul expresses essentially this truth by saying, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of life. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit that comes and abides in us and cleanses us from every stain and saves, saves us. It's the Spirit in every mystery. It's the Spirit that animates the body of Christ. It's the holy tradition. That's what holy tradition is. Holy tradition is not a man-made thing in the church, but it's the revelation of Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit given again and again and again throughout church history. So in a way, it's passed on from, as a tradition is passed on from, apostle to disciple etc etc and yet it is the spirit of god that is passing it on and making it fresh and new for every one of those disciples who as we saw earlier with saint andrew and saint maximus the confessor have made progress 
and are, are making progress in the spiritual life and more and more going deeper. No one, also, we read in St. John 6.44, no one comes to the Son if not drawn by the Father. And of course, the Father draws in the Holy Spirit in an unseen mystical way. So the Holy Trinity always is working to bring all of humanity, each person separately, to communion with him. So this is the this is the internal, inner, mystical, if you like, revelation that happens and must happen for each one of us if we're going to understand and accept the outward revelation, and in particular the book of Revelation. Obviously, again, as we see in Scripture, we know that those who do not confess Jesus Christ to be God do not have the Spirit of God, and they will fall away in the end times. There will be many who will fall away because they refuse to confess Jesus Christ to be God. Now, that confession of Jesus Christ to be God, do not think it be so narrow, so limited, uh, to refer only to the historical Jesus, as they say. No, no, no. Jesus Christ is alive, and he and he has never abandoned his church, and he lives in his church. He is the church. And so if you refuse to accept the presence now in the world of Jesus Christ, in his church, in his mysteries, now in the Orthodox faith and Orthodox church, and you reject that as a theanthropic body, you too are not confessing Jesus Christ to be God. Let me repeat that because that's a that's a bold thing to say in this day of ecumenism. But it's true. If one comes to reject Jesus Christ as body of Christ, to reject the church, to reject the presence of God in the world as body of Christ, he is the head, his body, we are the members. If they fall away from that truth and they say, Ah, the Church of Jesus Christ doesn't exist. Ah, the Orthodox Church is not the Jesus Christ, Church of Jesus Christ. And believe me, the body of Christ, like Christ himself, is crucified. Always. That's where the body of Christ is. It's a crucified. It has the marks. It's resurrected, and yet it still has the marks of the crucifixion. And it's still passing through. It, it has to pass through those trials and tribulations. That's the true church. And the, today we're under attack like never before, I think. I mean, maybe that's too bold of a statement. Maybe there's been worse days. I haven't experienced them all, but it seems to me that the Church of Christ today, with, with all of that which is going on around us, is under tremendous attack, unprecedented in many ways. And therefore, only those who have faith and trust and have spiritual eyes can see Jesus Christ today in the world in his body. It is the door that opens the eyes to have them have epignosis, true experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ's presence in the Orthodox Church is trust, faith, and all the other spiritual presuppositions. Love of truth in the end days will be the characteristic of the true Christian. So with this last form of inner revelation, we are called to approach the book of Revelation, to study and understand the book of Revelation. We have to have this inner revelation ourselves, each one of us, in order to truly understand the book. Now, a presupposition for understanding is divine illumination. So the question has to be for all, all of us, how do I approach and enter into divine illumination? Because our understanding must not be limited to or even mainly animated by academic, grammatical, poetic, or philological studies and aspects and knowledge gained by those means. If that's it, if we're approaching this in an academic fashion or a grammatical fashion, we're looking at the grammar of the scripture or the poetry or the philology or the whatever it might be. And many people sit in high, halls of higher learning and they focus on these aspects and they become experts of the language of the, of the New Testament or the language of the book of Revelation very limited, not going to open the door of illumination. Elder Athanasius, again, we what we desperately need to understand is that this is the living word of God who will speak in our hearts. Do you understand? Do you believe? He will speak to into your heart if you have what Elder Athanasius will say later. The Greek term is so expressive. Pothos. Pothos is the Greek term. 
That means great desire. You have to have great desire to know Jesus Christ, to love Jesus Christ, and to be immersed in the teachings of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. If without that, without that, without understanding, you're, you're standing before the person, the living word of God, and he himself is speaking to you, well, you will not enter in. So we are in a desperate need of this internal revelation to understand the book of Revelation. It is a closed book, and it was opened, as we saw last week, by the Lord Jesus Christ, but on, in part on account of the weeping of the great apostle. Only, only the man, the God-man Jesus Christ can open the, the scroll, but on what basis? What are the presuppositions for us to see and to read and to be given access to that scroll and understand the scroll? Well, that's... Uh, that's imaged forth by the weeping of the great apostle, which means his love and his desire and his belief to be in communion with the truth. So St. John now, very important the following, because we're surrounded by extra ecclesial traditions and ideas and teachings. And you, have to, you have to understand the following very much and enter into it. St. John, of course, saw Christ face to face. We will not see Christ face to face. We have a means by which we will come to the understanding. And it's not anything less than Jesus Christ himself, but through the following means. Through Jesus Christ's messenger, John, first of all, who wrote the book of Revelation. Through the Holy Tradition, as we said, the Holy Tradition is the life of the Holy Spirit in the church. It's not a man-made tradition. It's the life of the Holy Spirit in the church. All of that which has come down to us, inspired by God, through his prophets and apostles and martyrs and ascetics and, and all those made perfect through faith throughout church history, those speakers and teachers make up and give us the holy tradition. And the Spirit of God inspires that. You have to enter into it. And that's why we're quoting and going and running to the church fathers continually because that's the Spirit of God speaking to them. The 2,000 years experience of the church and church history teaches us as well. And this is the this is his story. Forgive me for the cliche, but this is Christ's history, right? The church, the body of Christ throughout the last 2,000 years is Christ, the Holy Spirit, working in the world, speaking and teaching. So this is also relevant. Of course, the written word, whether it be the very book or the teachings of the Holy Fathers, and the hearing of the word of God from the speaker. Now, I consider the speaker here, Elder Athanasius, I'm just the donkey who God has to use, unfortunately, to, to mouth these things. It doesn't matter, but you are getting spoken to uh, with the words of, of the great elder, and we're all sitting at his feet. These layers are essential. These layers are essential. If I disregard them, I'm left with nothing. This is Elder Athanasius's phrase. All right? These layers are not burying the meaning. They're revealing the meaning. They're Christ himself speaking to the world through He chooses to have his arms and legs and eyes and, 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 and everything that he, all the means, this is how he chooses to speak to the world in his body, and he is the head of it. So if you're not a part of that, if you're not immersed in that, if you're not making your uh, these things your focus, then you will not enter in. You will not enter in. And an example given by Elder Athanasius, which helps us to understand. Now, you're going to, he says, you're in, let's say you're entering a building. You enter the building, but you don't want the walkway. You don't want the entryway or the walkway. You want to actually go through that and then deeper into the building and then maybe even up the stairs or whatever it might be, through the hallway and through doors until you reach your destination. Now, if you're not gonna, you're not gonna disregard all those things in order to reach your destination. You're gonna use them. You're gonna traverse them to reach your destination. Somewhere deep in the building, you're gonna reach your destination. The only way to reach the destination of the inner revelation, that's the destination, the inner revelation, is through trust in the person of Jesus Christ, and above all, which. Uh, and all of all of the above, which he provides and uses. All right. So trusting him means to use that things he provides. It is a tragedy, a travesty, 
worthy of our tears, that so many people who want to follow Jesus Christ, call them Christ themselves Christians, are not a part of this reality and do not make do not avail themselves to these things which Christ himself has given for them to know him and to know his revelation. God forbid that an Orthodox Christian would fall into the same terrible fate as to walk away and not to understand that these are the means and to follow them. <clears throat> now, we've we're in, in our analysis, we've looked at the term revelation. Again, just highlights of the teacher, the, the elders' teaching. There's so much more we could talk about. Uh, but we're also going to look at another term that's used in this first, first verse, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. This is another term that the elder wants to analyze, and uh, we're going to do that momentarily. But before we do that, let me just share a few things more that I did not uh, put into the the um, PDF. As I said, I've been at the doctor's office for hours today and wasn't able to finish up the PDF. I'll do that as soon as I can tomorrow and upload it to the Patreon page so all of you can have access to it. But some of the things that I think are valuable here that we need to remember. Uh the Lord himself wants these layers, these coverings, whatever you want to call it, essential for entering into the inner revelation because they restrict human haughtiness and arrogance and, and demand that man not depend on himself. Exactly what happens in many cases in some of the most extreme examples of the Protestant world is that people sit down with the Bible and they say, okay, I'm going to read the Bible. I don't need any anyone else. I don't need any mediator. I don't need any layers. I'm going to just enter into the Bible myself. I'm going to study, 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 study. And people become experts. They, they examine it. They, they memorize it. And yet, this is not God's will. It's not God's will for us to be individuals examining a book which belongs to his body, the church, and presupposes his initiation into that body for it to be open to us. Um, and you know, people say, I will, I'll figure this out. I'm special enough. Uh, the elder says, and the Spirit of God talks to me directly. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He speaks through his saints, his apostles. That's what he said. He gave his apostles, saints, and all the martyrs, and all the, the luminaries to speak to us. Uh, this is what the heretics say, according to Elder Athanasius. But he says, no, that's not true. You will find these things through the words of the speaker, through the printed word, through the St. John the Evangelist, who heard all this, this will bring you humility and will restrict your human haughtiness. Furthermore, man can only be saved through this, his fellow man. Man is saved through the church, by the church. Through the church, by the church. By the way, everything has to be done in Christ and for Christ. Through the church and by the church. Same thing. I'm being redundant. I'm repeating myself. Individual salvation does not exist. Let's understand this. One who would wish to be saved alone without the help of the church and the help of the brothers and sisters, let's grasp this. This particular person who wishes to be saved alone will never be saved. He'll never be saved. God help all those people. Again, who say, I can do it alone. I'm on it alone. It's just me and Christ, me and the Bible. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to do this. You will not, you're not on the path of salvation. Listen to what he says. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, him meaning Jesus Christ, uh, gave it to the apostle. So this revelation, which is enacted through Jesus Christ, is about Jesus Christ. Right? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, the Father gave to the Son, Jesus Christ, the person. Jesus Christ refers to the human nature of Christ. And the human nature of Christ is finite. Listen to this, blow your mind. Listen to this, to blow your mind, all right? However, through the hypostatic or personal union with the Word of God, the human nature of Jesus Christ now can be considered omnipresent. Present everywhere. 
not by its own merit, but by the hypostatic union with the God of the Word. The, the human nature of Jesus Christ, which is finite, is now united and is omnipresent because of the hypostatic union with God. Don't try to rationally figure it out. This is a spiritual reality that's been revealed. It blows the human mind and his ability. All right? So God gives this revelation to Jesus Christ, who will in turn give it to John, and John will pass it down to the church. Sound like it's a it's a loner thing here? Is this a one, one, one me and Jesus here? This is a, a, a work of the Holy Trinity in the body of Christ through the apostles. How did Christ receive the revelation from God? From God the Father, Jesus Christ. And by God, we mean the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right? So how did Jesus Christ... We see it in the very book of the Revelation that we are studying. In the quote now, the quote, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing. I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the, all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. He took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Revelation 5, 6 to 7. So I saw in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, these living creatures of the cherubim, a lamb, a slain lamb, but it was standing up. A slain lamb standing up. Who's that? Jesus Christ. Slain but standing. The very thing that Christ will tell John in direct revelation. I am the one who died, and behold, I live again. The slain lamb who lives. Behold, I live. This is Jesus Christ. The Son of God cannot become dead. The divine nature obviously cannot die. So the human body died because of the crucifixion and the burial in the tomb. This is the most beloved image of the, of the church, and especially the early church, the ancient church, had this is the most precious symbol, the lamb that is slain but stands. Behold, I am the one who died, and behold, I live again. This is Revelation 118. We're going to study that shortly. So one must progress very much, Elder Athanasius says, to come to understand these things. Right? These things are not understood cursory and quickly, but you have to you have to understand through spiritual wisdom. You have to have epignosis. You have to have experience. You have to have the inner revelation that is necessary for us to understand the book. So, again, the scroll says here that he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. All right, the scroll cannot be opened but by Jesus Christ, all right? There is no one found, no one is worthy to open up the mysteries to have the knowledge. Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals? 5-2, no one. No one is worthy to open the scroll. And John was weeping, we said. Remember, he was crying. God have mercy, what will happen here? The angel says, do not weep. Someone has been found. The slain lamb will open the scroll. He will open the scroll. In other words, he will reveal. He is his revelation. He's the one who reveal it to John. He's the one who reveal it to you and I. It is living God before which we stand. He reveals things. This is why the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, meaning it reveals and manifests Christ. And then you say, how is it possible that we have not studied this book, right? It reveals and manifests Jesus Christ. Consequently, the revelation takes place through Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ, about Jesus Christ. Christ is all in all. Christ is everything. Without him, we can do nothing. Without him, we can understand nothing. Without him, we are lost. Jesus Christ. This is the meaning of the words of revelation of Jesus Christ, which gave, God gave unto him. He gave it unto him to show his servants. And now we come to the question of must. All right, so let's go to our next card. This is the most interesting and very wonderful aspect of the elders' teaching here, the must of Holy Scripture. So he's going to show this to the servants of Jesus Christ, things he must show shortly take place. These things must take place quickly, which, which must take place. The must is the most interesting aspect here. Now, this must is a mystery. 
has great theological dimension and just a second I'm not following uh, it has great theological dimension in Holy Scripture so what is this all about why must it happen let's look at some other aspects and other examples of must in Holy Scripture and we'll understand better what is going on here this must say soon take place. You say, well what this is the necessity. I mean, how is this must? How does it, what does it mean? Because we know that Jesus Christ does not force himself in any way upon anyone, but it calls us all freely to embrace him. So in Daniel 2, 28 to 29, we read, But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what must be in the last days. What must be in the last days. In Matthew 16, 21, we read, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And again in Luke 24, 26, Was it not necessary, must happen, that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And Elder Athanasius tells us, We see that this must, this necessity of the church, to undertake a journey full of tribulation parallels the most parallels the most of the journey of Christ, right? So we have the journey of Christ. He must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer. He must breathe. The church is the same way. Could not happen any differently because the church is the very body of Christ. It's impossible for it to happen in any other way. We, the church is the body of Christ. We will follow that and we will parallel that journey. It must happen for us as well. This is the way salvation is going to be achieved. So when, uh, when God says, this is a typo I was, I was speaking as I was in the doctor's office <laughs> uh, trying to get this on paper for you. When, when God says that I must be put to death, I must be crucified, the church must also say uh, I must suffer death. I must be crucified. All right, this is super important because if you have an idea of Christianity, like some of these various heretical groups out there, gospel prosperity, gospel, or what I, I don't, I, I must admit, I've not spent much time examining this, but just from the very cursory examination, they're so far from the understanding uh, that we're presenting here tonight. And it, obviously, they're not going to reach knowledge, they're not going to enter into the meaning of the scripture. Uh, they've made a, a mess of it, and 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 you will also not be able to understand why the church must suffer in the end times and must suffer during the Bolsheviks, right, or the Turkish period, or the iconoclasts, or the Aryans. We must enter into the crucifixion. It's a must. And I rem I'm reminded, and I've said this before in other talks, it's very appropriate here. I'm reminded about the Russians who met Elder Shafroni in Paris. You remember this story. I've said it before. And they said, why has our Lord abandoned the Russian people and we are decimated and the church is decimated, etc., etc." And the elder said, no, you've got it wrong. He could have said, no, you don't understand. This must happen. This had to happen. He could have said. This is the time of triumph for the church. This is the time in which we offer up to God tens of thousands, millions of martyrs. This is the time the church's role in the world is fulfilled. This is the purpose and role of the church. Not to be a worldly, glorious empire on earth, but to suffer and to die and to be crucified like our Lord did so that we will be resurrected, so that we will shine in heaven. And this is the time when the triumph of the church, just when the world says the church is decimated, Christ is dead in the tomb, is the time that the victory is being won. The must of Christ, the must of the Apostle Paul, let's remember the Apostle Paul, what did he say? In Acts 24, what did he say? Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. There it is again, the must. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. People are saying, why is so much terrible things happening in the church of Christ today? 
churches being shut down, bishops denying basic realities, priests, I don't know, whatever you want to commemorate. There's much to commemorate about the, the tribulation that the church is passing through with COVIDism or humanism or whatever the various heresies that are afflicting the church today when we're distorting the life of the church, distorting the, the truth of the gospel in the life of the church and not making it manifest to the world, well, maybe we need to remember we must suffer tribulation. What did they say in the 30s? You, you who attended the course in the summer when we were doing the new martyrs, do you remember? This is... This is the purpose of the church. I mean, they were, they were, they understood what had to happen, and they, contrary to Sergius and the renovationists, the same understood. They were going to go into exile. They were going to be slaughtered, and that's what had to happen, in order to be with Christ. Right. So, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. If there is a church you're going to. If you're not Orthodox, or if there's even a parish or someone you're following within the Orthodox Church who does not preach this truth, Christ crucified, you are not, do not follow him, but turn away and follow those who are teaching and preaching. Even in the church, people can fall away. People can fall away from the church and have many, many times throughout church history. So you have to go and follow those who are tried and tested and are teaching the church the truth about the gospel so there's the must of christ is to go up to jerusalem the must of paul is through many tribulations the we will enter the kingdom of god and the things that must take place quickly we hear in the gospel in the uh, book of revelation these are all parallel This must of Christ goes, the people would have, uh, be, this is because as far as this must of Christ goes, Elder Athanasius I'm reading now, the people would have opposed the person of Christ. They would have opposed his mission. In order to have it transpire, the work of salvation needed to be accomplished by any means. So Christ made it to the cross, the organ of the negation, uh, and the organ of the, of the negation of salvation, the cross, became, became the way of salvation. He's turned it all on his head. The whole worldly mentality is totally upside down. This is why the Lord said, I must, and the church must, for the same reason, pick up the cross. I want to add something to the elders' teaching, which occurs to me, and I've said before. I mean, besides the obvious scriptural passage, if they persecute me, they will persecute you. But also, there's something that the Lord said. If I be lifted up on the cross, he said, I will draw all men to myself. If I be lifted up, the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross, he will draw all men to himself. Is this not applicable also to the church? If the church is not lifted up on the cross, it is not an organ of salvation. It is not drawing men to Christ. It is not imitating Christ in the crucifixion. It is not a means to salvation. Insofar as those who call themselves Christian or even in the Orthodox Church, who are not a part of this mystery and seeking it out. Now, we are weak and worldly and lukewarm Christians, but we have to at least seek and beg God to make us worthy to be lifted up on that cross, to carry that cross, to accept the crucifixion, to accept the persecution, to accept the rejection of the world. We have to be ready and willing to do that if we want to be a part of that drawing all men to Christ. This is exactly the opposite of what? The spirit of Antichrist. Secularization. What does it do? It does the opposite. It identifies with those who did not and refused to ascend the cross. It identifies with the Pharisees who say, come down from the cross and then we will believe. That's the secularized church of Antichrist. We have to do the opposite if we're going to be with Christ and be a conduit, a, 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 a point of reference for the world to meet and, and embrace Christ and therefore ourselves be saved, right? We can't be indifferent to the others around us and not have any witness to them and expect ourselves to be with Christ. He says, "You will know they will know you are my disciples by your love, first and foremost, of Christ, of course, and of the brethren 
And that love is crucifixion. That's that's what that's the love he showed us. He showed us the cross as the organ of love, self-denial and so and crucifixion. This is how the world is drawn to Christ. Insofar as Christians turn away from that, embrace the secularization of the church, are 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 reconciled to the world and do not witness and are not martyred for that witness against the spirit of Antichrist, which includes all of this insanity that we're living through, right? All of the isms of our day, the nihilism that we see around us. If we're not witnessing against that, teaching people to flee that and 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 ourselves are not ascended to the cross and crucified continually, that means our passions. That means the ways of the world and the thinking of the world. If we're not a part of that mystery of the cross, we're a stumbling block and not a conduit for the salvation of our brothers and sisters. God, give us that illumination, that strength, and that love of the crucifixion. So the question, of course, comes among all those who think in a worldly terms of goodwill, they're loving, wonderful people, I'm sure. We all are. We have our weaker aspects, but can't God find a better, easier way? Come on. Do you have to go through this? <sighs> Love and freedom are inseparable, brothers and sisters. This is going to be the great temptation of the last times. So the great temptation of all the Christians, many Christians who are still with one foot in the world and don't understand the mystery of the cross. This is the great temptation. They're going to say, where is God? Why does he not intervene? Why isn't God able to intervene? In other words, put an end to the persecution, put an end to the crucifixion, put an end to the trials, tribulations, and, and uh, all of that which is contrary to the church, the suffering of the people of God. Why doesn't he intervene? Where is he? Where is God? Oh, we hear this so often. Why didn't God stop this death? Why didn't he stop this disease? Why didn't he stop this persecution? All the time we hear this from Christians. Elder Athanasius says, if he intervenes, you and I will tell him, tell, you will tell me uh, that he is controlling you. He's not leaving you free. He's binding your freedom. This is also what we hear. You know, I don't go to church because you all are a bunch of enslaved, you know, to, to Pharisees, whatever it is. There's various ways people explain this in their perception of the church's life. Why does God choose this seemingly worse solution? Forgive me for the typos. I was writing this, as I said, on the way here from the, uh, from the doctor. It is because God loves and he wants to show his love. He offers his son to be crucified. He could have used another method. He could have used another method to save the world, but he chose not to. He chose to save the world with love, the crucifixion. Salvation moved by love is a deep mystery. It constitutes a mere fold of the love of God. Okay, there's much more by the great elder. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to it. We're already at an hour and 35 minutes. And I said tonight we're going to probably have to cut it short because I'm not feeling very well. But let me share a little bit more directly from the great elder about this very important aspect here about freedom and love uh, and how uh, that is to be understood in the church. He quotes St. Isaac the Syrian, and he says, now, he says, this is something I read, and initially I didn't really embrace it, but now I understand it, he says. Humbly, the elder says and shares with us this. This is the 81st homily of St. Isaac the Syrian. And he says, in the final analysis of all these things, our God and the Lord, due to his strong love for his creation. All right? This is, this is on the basis of everything, all the economy of God, for his strong love for his salvation. And this is the key. Strong, great love, burning love, right? Again, the word, as I said earlier, is pothos. It's a Greek word, and it means great desire, burning love. He gave his son to the death on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
to suffer death for it. John 3, 3, 16, the famous line, everybody should know that. This was not because God could not save us in a different way, but because this was the way that God found to show and teach his immense love. Our mind cannot grasp this. He touched us. He drew near to us through the death of his son to show us how much he loves us. He loves us exceedingly, and if he had something even more precious than his own son, he would have given it to us. All this was accomplished so our human race could find its way back to him and to draw near to him. As we've said many times, every single thing that happens from God, in God, by the church, in the church, if it's of God, is for salvation. Everything that is not about salvation is about the world, it's about other aspects, it's very kind and wonderful and sweet and pretty, but it's not about salvation. It's not leading to salvation. It's not of God. It's not a part of his plan. It's not a part of his economy. Everything he did, he did for our salvation. Because of his great love, he did not wish to bind our freedom. Even though he could do this, he chose to let us to come to him in the spirit of love. All these things, my friends, express the mystery behind those things that must take place. With this solution, the love of God is made obvious. So at the same time, the freedom of the individual is preserved. This is a great mystery that, that, by the way, many heterodox have fallen and stumbled here. Calvinism, some of Augustinian, extreme Augustinianism, these are examples of them stumbling on this truth that we're talking about right now, this freedom and love together, inseparable. The freedom is in, of the individual is preserved at the same time. God is truly wonderful. These two elements, freedom and love, espoused and working together in the life of the faithful individual, will give birth to holiness. Why do we have a dearth of sanctity in the world? Why do people say about the loss of sanctity, the loss of holiness, loss of respect for the human person? Right here. This is why. Because the Christians, those who call themselves Christians, stepped away from this experience, and this truth, and this life, and they lost the narrow path, the royal path, the balance, and everything swirled out of control and continues to swirl out of control in the Western world, but all throughout the world. today. Those things that must take place soon, soon, third term now, revelation must soon. Soon, how soon? St. And Andreas, St. Andrew of Caesarea says, some of these prophecies are at hand, ready to happen, and if you will, they began to happen as soon as the book was written. And those things that will be at the end of history and are prophesied will take long, because 1,000 years for God is as one day as yesterday. Things, Elder, Elder Athanasius says, things are like a chain, right? They start out as a chain that extends until the close of history. Talked about this last time, about the cyclical and linear, the ball that rolls through history, repeats itself, and yet goes forward, right? So this soon means a quick start, not necessarily a fulfillment, not the end. It starts, it ends immediately. No, it starts immediately, but a constant and continued revelation. A total fulfillment of this revelation will be at the end, right? The total fulfillment of the revelation of Jesus Christ and the Apostle John will be at the end of history and the second coming. Beginning and the end of these events, therefore, are seen under the spectrum of one and the same image. Let me repeat that. The beginning and the end, Alpha and Omega, one person, Jesus Christ, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end of these events, therefore, are seen under the spectrum of the same image. So the elder says, look, 2,000 years from Abraham, 2,000 years before Christ, God tells Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. It seemed to them very far away, very far away, 2,000 years before Christ. And now, it's been 2,000 years since the first coming of Christ. He says, I don't think, he says elsewhere in a great homily on the, at that time, coming so-called Eighth Ecumenical Council. He's talking about the Council of Crete that eventually happened. It's an amazing homily. Elder Athanas is an amazing homily. Prophetic homily. This is probably in the 90s or early 90s, I'm guessing. And he's talking about the preparation for this. And he says in there, quoting the same thing here that he quotes, 
talks about this 2,000 years of past. It's We're close, he says. Forgive me. You might disagree with me, he says. You might think I'm crazy, but I think we're close. I think we're close. And he says, just like the, the phrase from the professor Bratziotis, he was a professor in Athens who taught years ago in the 70s, 60s and 70s, and he wrote a commentary in the book of Revelation. And he says in that commentary, it is like we can hear and sense the galloping of the horses, the galloping of the upcoming events. We can sense them already, like the galloping of a horse on a cobbled street. You can imagine that. You can feel that, right? You can hear the hooves hitting the cobbled street, right? It's coming. This is what he says about our days, Elder Athanasios. You can feel it coming. You can sense the end of the world coming, he says. It's understood that these events are on their way quickly, and yet 2,000 years have passed. And yet 2,000 years have passed. Now we can pose the question, might the end of history be near, or at least beginning the beginning of the end be near? And he answers, my friends, perhaps. Perhaps. So that's the end of our lesson. The Lord is coming. Come quickly, O Lord, we pray. And this will be our constant return to this phrase again and again and again. This is what we want to have, each one of us. That stance, that eschatological stance, that vigilant stance, that watchful stance, that we look for the coming again of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, that's wrong. Okay. That's the end. Let's take questions. Let's see what kind of questions we have from all of you. Uh, hopefully, John has been collecting them. Let's see what he's got for me. Uh, no questions yet. All right. Well, let me know if you got questions. We'll go over to the Crowdcast folks. They always have questions. We're at uh, 144. I think we can have some time for questions. Let's see what we got. Anything off topic, we'll leave for Thursday for all of you who are asking off topic. Uh, questions. We're here tonight to talk about the book of Revelation and the talk. So let me just scan these questions for a second here and make sure we're asking questions that are on topic. Question from Max. Thank you, Max. In what sense the fulfillment is imminent if Revelation was written almost 2,000 years ago? <laughs> well, Max, you just got your answer. Just go back about three minutes here, uh, and I think you should have your answer. Is that a calling for us to be vigilant? No. So we just said it's both and. It's then and now. It's a continual unfolding. It began immediately, and yet it will end in the second coming. And yet even so, and he says, look, 2,000 years from Abraham, and that was a long time. We've already been 2,000. All right? So he's trying. the point he's trying to make is, hmm, seems like we're close. Elder Athanasius. Seems like we're close. I think you got your answer, Max. Forgive me if I'm not going to um, repeat what I just said. I think that's your answer. Hopefully you, you're satisfied. Seraphim. I have read that St. John was the Bishop of Ephesus when he was writing the book of Revelation. Is this accurate? Thank you for all that you do for us. Seraphim, you could say he's the bishop in the sense that he's an overseer. You cannot say that he's the one that's being written to, obviously. He's writing from Patmos. He's in exile. And he was never a bishop of any one city. He was an apostle. The apostles were not bishops. The apostles were apostles. They left bishops. They left overseers, people responsible for the church in that place that they preached. And they departed. And those were the ones that they were communicating with, the leaders of the local churches. Essentially, the bishop and priest was one, right, in a small community. Imagine you start a parish you have one person in charge of that parish. They called them the bishop, functioned as a priest. When the church grew immensely over the next couple hundred years, then you had a differentiation, and you had one man overseeing several communities. He was called the bishop, and the locals were called the priests. But essentially, in the beginning, it was identical. Uh, so no, he was not the bishop of, of Ephesus. He was overseer of many places. And that's why the, the letters are going to many local churches. Father, can you please let us know in advance after each lesson what pages, chapters we should read in the first volume of So He Pressed before the next lesson? Well, we're covering essentially chapter by chapter. So last week we were, we, we were looking at the introduction, 
uh, that would be in this uh, edition I have here. Now, this is an older edition. I don't think the page number has changed, but they might have. Uh, but in my version, we're looking at page 19, Introduction. That was for last week's uh, lecture. And we covered that material. And now we're in Chapter 1, Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. That's page 32, 30 uh, to 30 to 41. All right? So we're in page 31, I should say, to 41. This ver this week, we covered pages 31 to 41 in my version. That's essentially chapter one. We had other material we're adding to it. Obviously, we're not going to be doing just these. We had uh, words about St. Uh, Andreas of Caesarea. Now, next week, we'll definitely cover the material in chapter two, Revelation 1 to 1, 4. That's pages 43 through 53. All right. Next week, meaning two weeks from now. And everybody remember this. And uh, hopefully you've uh, you've got the uh, you've seen again and again at the beginning of these lectures our uh, schedule right, and you've seen that we're not going every week we're going every other week, and so next Tuesday we will be here and we'll be lecturing on another topic. We'll return to the Book of Revelation the following week, and it's a good time for me to announce that next week we're going to be looking at a very interesting topic. Let me bring it up here. Uh, I think you're all going to want to come and listen. There's nothing that exists in English. Uh, and let me just plug it. This is a huge book, right? And I'm probably not going to read all of it, uh, finish all of it by next Tuesday. I don't need to because what I want to lecture on is in a few chapters. This is a book in Greek, I Kolivadis ke Odorotheos Vulismas. The Kolivadis and the uh, Archimandrite Dorotheos Vulismas. This is the Zitima, the the question, let's say, of the uh, review of the pedalion uh, that by uh, Dorotheos Vulismas. And there's a lot here. I can't get into it now. I can't explain it all now, obviously. But anybody who's interested in the question, did St. Nicodemus the Hagiorite actually not support, not want the uh, position he took in the medallion eventually. I mean, just the question is absolutely absurd, but anyway, it's been asked and people believe this, which is a, sh which is a shame, that St. Nicodemus was not disciplined enough uh, and compromised on his own views regarding the question of reception and, and question of mysteries outside the church and baptism of the, of the uh, Frankish Latin at the time. That whole question is very important to the Orthodox Church. It was, def it was definitive for hundreds of years what St. Nicodemus uh, and, uh, ended up publishing in the Pedalion, uh, along with his, with his uh, brother in Christ and fellow worker, which has also been misunderstood by many, Dorotheos Vulismas, that the idea, the question is, well, he didn't really believe that because we have correspondence now, supposedly, where he's saying, no, I think we could, we could go with uh, just chrismating. We don't need to baptize any of, of the converts from the Latins. That's a huge question today in the Orthodox Church. And there are people who, who claim that St. Nicodemus actually taught uh, or wanted uh, in, in his pedalion, in his uh, collection of the canons, a different position that he actually took, which was uh, the, position, the position of, of the need for those coming over to be baptized. So I'm going to look at the letters. I'm going to look at the correspondence. I'm going to look at the role of St. Paisius Veliskovsky, very important, very great defender of the same position in the uh, Romanian um, uh, Moldavian church and and you might think well this is really kind of remote and kind of academic but it's actually extremely interesting and important and you'll you'll enter into a big debate in the church right now uh, and I think it'll be very fun so that's next Tuesday this time next Tuesday we're going to be doing this pray to God that I can not get I'll get well I won't get sicker and uh, we can look at it and then the following Tuesday as is scheduled we'll return as usual and we'll look at the next uh, few lines of the book of Revelation and the teachings of the great elder. All right. Hopefully that's helped everybody. If you have any doubt, if you look at the beginning of this um, of a live stream or you go to our video on Orthodox Ethos, which is the promotional video, there's a screenshot there which gives you the entire schedule through June uh, of our lectures. And you can see there what we're going to cover. It's pretty obvious. It says right there, you know, Apocalypse of uh, Revelation versus and then it's got a title for uh, what we're going to be uh, addressing. All right. Uh, question here. 
uh, Father, could you put the footnotes of the book from EAM, from Elder Athanasius Matelineos, so that we're able to read it in detail? Um, the footnotes. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean by the footnotes. I mean, he doesn't have many footnotes at all. Uh, do you want me to put the page numbers? Is that what you're asking? You want me to quote the pages I'm, I'm commemorating? Uh, let me know. Send me a little clarification. I'm not really sure what you mean by the footnotes. Um, all right. I'm going to shoot over to our questions from the U YouTube and Facebook and other pages and see what we got. Now, we've got a question from Sh Sean or Shane uh, Zambonini. Uh, what is the Greek word for must in these verses? Uh, it, you know, that's a good question because I, I did not consult the Greek. Uh, I didn't see, see it as necessary, but it should be prepi. The word prepi is the Greek word. I'm 90% uh, sure. Uh, but uh, well, that's one version of the Greek word for must. Uh, but I can actually bring it up pretty quickly here. Let me actually do that and confirm. Uh, so let me, uh, uh, let me see. Yeah, the, probably the easiest way is to do it uh, this way. Okay, one second, and I'll let you know. Um, yeah, actually, uh, yeah, they got a, and it's so avi. So the, the Greek, I'll, I'll read you the whole Greek. It's not preppy. It's something which basically means the same thing. Apocalypse is su Christu, in evokin afto theos, vixitis dulis aftu avi. Yeneste and Tahi. So the A V is essentially the translation is what must, or this version uh, is, um, I guess it's the King James, not really sure. It, it What things it behooves to take place, what must take place. A V, Delta, Epsilon, Yota, A V, Yeneste, and Tahi. What and Tahi is the soon, uh, which means quickly. All right. Hopefully that's uh, answers your question. Uh, Father bless. How do those uh, how do those of, of us with kids approach the blessing of martyrdom when protecting our kids is so important? Uh, you know, we have examples. Uh, well, first of all. Before we get to the question of. You know, I mean, this is a personal question. There's two answers. There's the general answer. The general theoretical answer, we, we can take that from scriptural passages, we can take that from the lives of the saints, and we can get a bit, uh, what would be expected of us or what would be what we would be called to. And it's it's pretty obvious in church history and in the scriptures what we're called to. And then there's a question of you personally, with your spiritual father, talking about how to deal with persecution, how to deal with martyrdom. And, you know, we do have examples of saints, St. Saint Cyprian of Carthage, I've commemorated before, when he walked away from martyrdom initially, not in fear, but in discernment. Uh, when they started persecuting, he actually left for the mountains. But then he came back at a later time and was martyred. So it, there's discernment also always necessary. You have to speak with your spiritual father and have guidance how to encounter various persecutions and martyrdom. That's a particular application. That's not the question, the general question, which is, do Christians, how do Christians hierarchize? How do they prioritize? How do they see uh, when confronted by two different things, which is the higher calling? And the Lord is very clear. If you love mother or father or brother or sister more than me, you are not worthy of me. So if theoretically someone was faced with martyrdom for Christ or fleeing martyrdom because well, I love my kids and I don't want my kids to be lost or something like that, or not trusting God uh, with your children or whatever. I mean, obviously that's not the perfection of the gospel, right? So theoretically, and we have saints like Saint, um, uh, Kirl and you, uh, Ki, Ki, uh, what's his name? Uh, the mother and child in July, we celebrate the feast. I think it's the 11th of July. And the name just escaped me. 
and it's right on the edge of my tongue. Anyway, we have examples of saints, mothers and children, Sophia and others, who I've, who stood by and as their children were being martyred, right? And they were martyred themselves. And then we have, we, of course, mothers who were encouraging their children to be martyred. Uh, so is there, if we were faced with martyrdom as a family or our children were faced with martyrdom or we were faced with martyrdom, obviously this is the quintessential uh, greatest example for all of Christians throughout 2,000 years. I mean, the, the, the Feast of All Saints was initially the Feast of All Martyrs. Uh, the church has always embraced this as, and especially in the early church, as a, a great victory and a great uh, uh, um, ascetic uh, 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 exploit, which ends in salvation. And there's no doubt that martyrs who give their life to Christ are in heaven with Christ. Uh, uh, so, um, so there you go. There's there is plenty of example in a in, in scriptural passage to support, generally speaking, the need for parents to not shrink from martyrdom or not have their children shrink from martyrdom. Having said that, that does not mean that you or anybody in particular. I'm telling people that I, I'm guiding them spiritually in how to deal with persecution. Obviously, that has to be done on a personal basis, and we have to go through a process. But that's what we're called towards, very high and very uh, great calling uh, for uh, for us all as Christians. Uh, a friend here uh, who is uh, following the class just sent me uh, a reminder that D and Kri are the most common must words in ancient Greek and probably kini. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, Thomas. Uh, so, I mean, I just thought of the term prepi, but obviously that's not uh, the uh, terms used here. So, another question, Andy Heracles. What is the meaning of freedom in the context of how you are using it and in Scripture? What is the meaning of freedom? Uh, well, I think... The elders, the context of the elder that I quoted here is pretty obvious, and that is the the um, the uh, implanted aftoxusia is the Greek term, right? So the self determination, self, um, you know, that which God has implanted, which is in the, which is a reflection of the image of God, which God has Himself. This is not a freedom to sin, obviously. It's not the kind of freedom that people talk about in the political world. Uh, it's a part of the nature, the, the image of man, and that God does always, in many examples in Scripture, never forces anyone to follow or to love him. He even turns to the apostle Peter after they've walked away, after he, he calls them to eat his body and drink his blood, and he says, would you also leave to the twelve? Uh, or he says, anyone who wants to be my disciple, pick up the cross and follow after me. It's total and 100 percent. We have to freely choose to be his disciple. This is what we're talking about here. Uh, there's no forcing of salvation. There's no uh, there's no predetermination. There's no uh, the, the whole Calvinist approach is obviously not orthodox, not defensible. Uh, none of that is um, none of that approach to the to the relationship of man and God and salvation in Christ can be understood in those kind of uh, con that kind of context. So I don't know. Uh, that's how we understand freedom. We're talking about this kind of freedom uh, in Christ, meaning it's a part of the way God intended us uh, to be, but also to be saved, uh, never by force. Uh, where does uh, that icon come from that is on the screen? Oh, well, this is an icon in the chapel the, the, of the Cave of Revelation. It's an icon on the on the iconostas, and uh, uh, it shows uh, it's depicting aspects of the Revelation. And this is the uh, uh, an image uh, of he who opens the scroll, he who gives the revelation, and further down. Uh, as you can see, let's see, I think we have at the very beginning, if we go back uh, here, you can see the entire image, right? So St. John is having the vision and the lampstands and the angels and all the rest here is being depicted as what we see in the book of Revelation. 
All right, one or two more questions and we'll call it a night. And we'll pick up these questions uh, on Thursday in our uh, uh, in our question and answer session uh, on Thursday as usual. Let's see if we have any re relevant questions to the... Um, uh, Okay, there's some relevant questions, but I, I'm going to leave it because they're pretty involved. Uh, one of those is very involved. Let's see. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Linda, I think, let's ask, let's see this question. Father, bless, we hear from our Holy Fathers that prophecies are revealed to us for repentance. Prophecies there, well, yes, not only, not only for repentance, but certainly for salvation, which includes and presupposes repentance. Prophecies, therefore, can be changed or lessened. Um, again, we're talking about um, we were this this we, this discussion we were having was in particular reference to uh, prophecies about imminent events in Greece, if I remember correctly, by contemporary saints and elders. Uh, so that was the context. Is it correct, Orthodox, to think that revelations are no matter what events to take place? Repentance does not mean the events to come, delayed perhaps, but not lessened. Uh, so there's no questioning in the actual scriptural text that were commemorated tonight. No one is leaving it open that this this is this is that which will come to play, but come to pass, right? So. This will happen. This is a revelation of that which will happen. Now, the question of the ascent of Antichrist and therefore the second coming, we've said in, in past lectures, the time of this is unknown and, according to some, is unknown for the reason that it's a mystery of man's freedom to love or turn away from God. In other words, the relinquishing or the loosing of the devil at the end of the world in, 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 in the world is directly related to the apostasy of Christians, the worldliness of Christians, the secularization of the Christian people. That's what looses the devil, right? So when people turn away from God, turn away from the narrow path, crucifixion, then what happens well, they give rights to the enemy. They Essentially, they say, I'm following you, right? And then he is free, so to speak, to bother and enslave. And they've given him that they've opened the door to him to bother and enslave them. So that's why more, more and more apostasy, less and less crucifixion in the life of the cross and asceticism means the demons and the devil have more rights and therefore more power over people they, they cannot get it on their own people have to give them the power and so you see this in this mystery of, this, of salvation and the mystery of iniquity that at the heart of that is the freedom of human beings to choose or reject god and that determines the events essentially and the these the coming of the events of the final events this last seven years of the book of apocalypse and the prophecies of our lord and all the rest and so in that sense, it could be delayed or it could be sped up and it does depend on the repentance of people. Uh, but these events per se are going to happen. They're not up for, for reversal. We can't, we're not, it's not that Christ will not come back one day. He will come back. It's not that there won't be an Antichrist. There will be an Antichrist. And all of that that's been prophesied will come to pass. Um, Let's see if there's any other questions. I think we can call it. Okay, here's one more question. I don't know if I can answer. We'll try. Father Bless, to your point about risks of creative interpretations of Revelation and Scripture in general that are outside church and patristic and orthodox tradition, do you think such risks are somewhat more pronounced with recent converts to orthodoxy that unwittingly bring in some of the heterodox interpretations from their previous religious movements? I'm thinking of ex-evangelicals and similar millenarian, millenarian movements. Thank you. Um, certainly, um, certainly the lack of 
of, of initiation and proper understanding of the Orthodox Church is going to uh, open up people to um, all kinds of heterodox ideas. And if people come in and they're not properly catechized, uh, if people come in, they're not properly initiated. Uh, if people come in and they don't have a good Orthodox teacher, all of these things are going to have, you know, we're going to have, I'm just saying Greek zizania, we're going to have weeds <laughs> grow up uh, in and among the Orthodox people. And I think that's what we're, we're witnessing in some ways. Uh, it's so important, the initiation process, the catechumenate, and the, and the whole process of initiation from the beginning, uh, from the very time that person walks into the church to the time that they're baptized, chrismated. And that process is so vast, it's so important. The church was so interested in the ancient church to make sure that that, I mean, it went on for years, right? Well, it's not, we're, we're, we have no, I don't see how, any real justification today. And there's always exceptions. There's always exceptions. And some people say, well, maybe there's many exceptions. I don't know. But generally speaking, a stance of bishops and priests today to have a very short catechumen, a very short process of initiation, where you have weeks or months, six months, eight months, a year, this to me is totally unjustified. Because if in the ancient world, which had far less delusion and heresy, 20th century is a heresy, of, is a century of heresy and delusion, right? The rise of the new age, the rise of ecumenism, the rise of all these isms, nihilism, I mean, it's 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 unprecedented in the history of the church, uh, and uh, so you got to realize we have great great need of a deeper and more systematic uh, catechism and initiation. And when we don't do that, of course we're going to allow for her heretical or heterodox teachings to creep in. We're going to allow for various delusions to be passed off as acceptable within the Orthodox Church. So yes, uh, but. I don't think it's. I don't think you need to necessarily say. Well, it's the risks are great because of the converts. It's it's anywhere there's not catechism, right? There's many people who are grown up in the church, even in Greece, who have no clue about any, any of these things. They've not been taught. They've not been guided, uh, and yet they grew up in the church. So I don't think it, I don't think we should say it's only converts, right? They're only the baggage of the converts. It's anywhere there's not proper catechism, uh, and so. Um, Thank God that there has been an attempt. I've met now two very bright young, uh, younger men who are focusing on catechism as a, a master's and, do and doctorate uh, thesis. They're very interested in 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 proper catechism. I think that's. I think that they're gonna, there's going to be both, and it's going to be polarization, and as it always does, and you're going to see more and more people saying we've got to get serious about that, and we've got to work on these things. And you're going to see more people um, uh, where others just just remain in in a kind of superficial approach. And people being, I mean, I was, I had a wonderful man who I loved dearly. He, you know, he was a priest later, but he was a layman when he catechized me. And he he did what he received. And that was, he gave me a few books to read. And then he said, you're ready to be baptized or, or to be received. So, you know. That's just not, that's not catechism. That's not initiation. You know, catechism is about purification. Catechism is about getting rid of all those internal and, and, and intellectual, but also spiritual uh, uh, sicknesses, diseases, her heretical ideas, heretical ways of thinking and living, uh, the passions, all that, so that you can be totally purified and cleansed so that when you reach baptism, you're able to receive all of the grace, and it's not. It is, and in many many ways, those who come with great pothos, with a great desire, and they've been through a process of purification, they will actually experience manifestly the grace of God in various ways. They'll see and experience things that are, you know, of of the spiritual world, and 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 they're confirmed in their their new life in Christ. Imagine if we all had that experience. What 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 strength we would have as Orthodox Christians, and what how little of the world would be able to affect us? But many people do not have any experience and very little change upon initiation, and therefore they don't feel and, and live the difference between the Orthodox body of Christ, the one church, and heterodoxy or the world. And they don't experience that, you know, existentially. You know, they don't understand it in their bones. Let's say. And therefore, 
they think, well, it doesn't matter if you're Orthodox. You can be saved. You can be initiated. You can have Christ. You can, you can do anything because, well, I, I didn't. I never agree. Great difference between me and my Protestant background. I see. I think that's the heart of why we have a lot of you know weeds in the church and growing uh, you know, more and more. All right. I think that's it for tonight. Uh, all of you have asked questions in uh, in Crowdcast. Uh, hope you can join me on Thursday, and we'll 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 uh, address your questions uh, there, uh, George. Uh, hopefully you'll be with us on Thursday. I hope you can join us and we'll answer your question. there. All right. Thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, let your uh, friends and family and others know about uh, this course. They might be interested. And uh, and hopefully uh, all of you will go out and get the first volume of the uh, Elder Athanasius' lectures from Zoe Press. and we can uh, be even more benefited by these lectures. Thank you very much. We'll chant tonight uh, the Holy Cross, the Trepine of the Holy Cross in Greek, and we'll end the session. And then I'll give you a little um, video uh, on the way out uh, from Patmos for those of you who didn't hear it last time. All right. God bless. Good evening. Say a prayer for me that I don't get sicker so I can be with you next next Tuesday. So son kiri et on lon su kevlongi son ting pliro no mi an su ni kas dis vansin lepsi kata var varon torumenos kenton son filaton Via tu stavrusu politevma. Through the prayers of our holy fathers, through the prayers of our elder Athanasius, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Let's see.